Um, yeah, so I have a co-presenter, so I'm going to be joined by uh, Alex Zinenko and Nicola Vasilash later. Uh, I'm just doing the beginning of the tutorial. Um, so welcome, everyone. I hope um, you attended the keynote, because we're not going to reintroduce everything. Um, and we have lots of content, so I'm going to try to get started very quickly. Uh, if you have questions, you can interrupt me. Uh, if your question may be long to answer, we're going to keep it for the end. We're going to stick around during the lunch if you want to chat about MLI or anything. Um, there's like some code on the slides, but everything, we're not necessarily going to go in details on the code. Everything is on GitHub um, in the example folder. So all of what is presented today is you can like build it, compile it, and play with it. Um, so. Yesterday, you attended the keynote, and they show you the great concept we have in MLIR. So today, we're going to try to um, show in practice uh, how to make use of MLIR to build uh, cool compilers. Um, so actually, yesterday, they told you MLIR is about what multi-level, Moore's law. They had many descriptions, but they got all wrong. So I think MLIR is a modular interpreting representation. <laughs> um, so to support the first part of the talk, I'm going to introduce a toy language. It's a high-level array-based language. Um, and later, uh, Alex is going to show you how to lower this to LLVM for Cogen. And Nicolas is going to introduce you a nice dialect for optimizing linear algebra in, in MLIR. So let's get started with toy. So at the bottom, you have a toy example. And so toy is like a Array-based language, variables are implicitly declared blocks. This is a, a function that takes three arguments uh, here. Um, you can declare variables. Uh, functions are generic. The arguments are not typed. So it's like a C++ template, because we're going to rely on the call sites to infer the types of those arguments later. Um, we consider variables are as immutable just because it was simple, simpler for the implementation of this tutorial. Um, when we have two built-in functions in this language, we can print and we can transpose arrays. <coughs> um, and we can also reshape arrays, assuming they have the same number of elements, by adding explicit dimension on, on the declaration. So we know that D is going to be an array of um, 2 by 4. And also for the implementation, I limited myself to like three-dimensional, uh, sorry, two-dimensional arrays, um, again, for simplicity. All right, so we want to implement a compiler for this language, so we're going to base ourselves on like existing successful model. And we can take uh, example on Clang, on Swift with SIL, or on Rust, where they even have like two high-level IR, HIR and MIR. Um, we could also take the Falcon compiler approach and try to embed our high-level semantic into LLVM using built-ins, using metadata, and custom passes that will like infer the high-level semantic of the language on the LLVM IR. That's what I call LVM IR plus. But I found this fairly heroic. Um, and the other approaches are fairly involved if we do the Rust or the Swift approach in terms of uh, infrastructure. So the simpler, the simpler approach of Clang is building an AST, but then we're going to have to have a mutable AST because we need to do shape inference. And we need to, what we want to do is infer, as I briefly mentioned, infer the type of every function arguments at um, call sites. So it's like template specialization. And in Clang, it's like the tree transform infrastructure. Um, and the AST is not super friendly to do all of this. Um, so we also may want to do high level optimization, like Chris explained yesterday, with, uh, with uh, doing language specific uh, kind of optimization. If you had like reference counting for us, it would be uh, buffer allocation, for instance, would be higher level optimization. Since we operate on value-based semantic and we have potentially big array, we need to be smart about it. Um, and we don't want to implement all the LLVM infrastructure, but also we want to be future-proof. And if you want to sometimes generate code for GPU or custom accelerators, FPGA, uh, whatever, um, going directly to LLVM IR may not be the most uh, convenient uh, place to do your optimization. So in, in MLIR, everything is about dialect. Um, so we can implement even our AST almost as a dialect in, in MLIR. Uh, I'm not going to do it in this case. So I've brought a very, very simple AST. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to work on an intermediate uh, IR for toy, uh, where we're gonna, just going to straight translate our AST to this IR. And then we're going to do uh, the equivalent of tree transform 
on this IR and some high-level language-specific optimization as well, uh, very quickly. So quick primer on MLIR. I'm going to go fast because I assume everyone saw the keynote yesterday. We talk about operations on that instruction because there is not a fixed set and it's designed for extensibility. But you can see opaque function, you can see operations like opaque function to MLIR. By default, MLIR doesn't know anything about, about those. And what's really important in MLIR, we have a very rich sets of uh, location. And for instance, here we know even that the location is a call site um, and, and you have very rich semantic and those are mandatory on operation. You have to really make it explicit if you want to drop it. Um, so I'm gonna go quickly over this. Um, uh, we have uh, the name of the operation, the equivalent of the instruction name. Uh, we can return multiple results. We take arguments, we uh, assess a value, that, and the, the pound is to identify which results from the instruction you want to get. Attributes is, is, are also functional arguments, but they are uh, guaranteed to be constant, and they are named, uh, so that opens up more convenience for some cases. Um, the way dialects are implemented in MLIR and they are, they are isolated is through this uh, syntax with this exclamation point for the types or as a prefix for the operation name. And that's like a namespace so they, take, they can reserve their custom types and their uh, operation and they don't conflict with each other. So this is an example of a fully valid um, textual MLIR. Um, you can take this, copy paste it and round trip it through MLIR opt as is. Um, and, and it's, it can be seen as problematic because it's fully textual. So that means MLIR doesn't know anything about it, which means we cannot verify any invariant on, on this right now. But we're going to show how to fix it. Um, I'm going to show a little bit of the C++ API. So what we want to do in our dialect, we, I mentioned we have two buildings. We have print and transpose. So this is the transpose one. So in MLIR, in the, the, our toy IR, we're going to have a transpose um, operation that takes one argument, and here you can see the shape. It's an array of two by three, and it's gonna return an array of three by two. Um, and so when you want to create, the builder interface in MLR is not much different from, from LLVM uh, in some ways, but here everything is opaque. You use strings to get your dialect. I use a string to get my, my uh, type here, and the type is opaque to MLR, and then I fill a structure um, with the input value and the return type, and I can create my operation. And that's how we create a fully opaque operation. But it's, it's, it's a bit broken because everything is string-based and that's, uh, MLIR doesn't know anything about it. So this is a catch. Here is uh, our toy print. This is the other built-in we have. And I can take this and round trip it to M through MLIR opt. And this is broken in, in many ways. I wouldn't want it to round trip. I want the verifier to fire and tell me that um, it's not a terminator, for instance. And now I have a basic block in my function without terminator. That should be a hard error in my IR. But um, since MLIR doesn't know anything about this operation, it will just assume that maybe it's a terminator. Uh, we also want our building to always take an operand, and here print doesn't take anything. And print shouldn't return a value, doesn't make sense. And if you look at the type here, like I don't know how to pass this. Like there's a name here, or like a string. And I, I really want it to be only numbers, and I want two dimension and a properly formed one. So that's why we define dialects. So dialect is really a way to register namespace and start adding rules around it. Um, so a dialect com is composed of a list of custom types, a list of operations, uh, and, and all the hooks for, for providing semantics uh, to those. And then you can also have your own passes and, and build your, your pipeline of transformation. So LLVM can be implemented as a dialect. All the LLVM semantic can be represented with MLIR, and with a dialect, uh, you can customize the pretty printing and the parsing to the point where it feels uh, fairly natural to, to use. Um, some, something that is very powerful uh, but hard to grasp at the beginning in MLIR is the concept of region. And operation in MLIR can have blocks a list of blocks attached to them and nested under the, under the app itself. And MLIR will not, uh, so a pass, a pass that doesn't know about this operation will not uh, necessarily analyze or understand this region. But you can use this to 
surround a block of code that you want to offload to an accelerator, for instance, or uh, as we, sh we shown yesterday in the keynotes, a uh, block of uh, affine loop nest was implemented with region. Uh, so just a few examples. Uh, again, because of the dialect in the affine world, you can have nice uh, pretty printing. But here, the affine for looks like a loop, but it's really an operation in a basic block. And inside, uh, attached to this operation, I lost the, OK. Attached to this operation, to the outer loop, you have a region. And in this region, you have another basic block with another operation that has inside another, uh, attached to it another region with another basic block. And there's the affine if, which also have a region inside. So there is this concept of nesting uh, that is very powerful because you can attach any restriction on, on the semantic of this. So in Toy, we don't need to use a region. Toy is simple enough that uh, I'm not going to make use of this. Um, but we use this in TensorFlow, for instance. And this is an example of how you could represent a data flow graph in MLIR. Uh, you create an operation with it, which is a TF graph. And in, inside, you have a list of basic blocks. But they are not really <laughs> connected like in a CFG. And, um, and we can just represent this kind of thing in MLIR, and that would be very hard to do in, in, in LLVM. So let's implement the dialect for toy. Um, so toy uh, usually find functions are fully generic. Um, so that's how we would translate um, a function that has just a multiply and a transpose, uh, generate the code for um, our tr transpose, that takes an array, return an array. Those are generic. We don't know anything about the size yet. Um, we do the multiplication, and we return uh, the result. And we can even have our custom terminator that we hook into, into, the, into the system. Um, for simplicity, I assume there will always be a main function in the module, and that's where we start the program. So we're going to start from the main program, and we're going to um, uh, find, uh, we're going to propagate shape. Because when you declare variables, you always have either an initializer where you can infer the shape, or they are explicitly provided. And when you find a user-defined call site, you recurse into the function and propagate the shape, and you also have to specialize it, make a copy of this function for these given uh, uh, shape arguments. And so um, the way we register a dialect in LLVM is fairly simple. Uh, in MLIR is is fairly simple. You inherit from the class dialect, and you can. Uh, override a few mechanism. Here I'm just going to override uh, the parse type um, so that I can have my custom types and print, pretty printing as well. And at this point, this is all I need to, to start playing with. Um, in the constructor, we can register our custom operations. I'm not going to show the detail of the code, but you can find it on GitHub. Um, the way we define custom types is by creating a, fa a facade to, to our types. So it's just a simple class that is a wrapper around the pointer to the unique type in the context. Just, so just like in LLVM, our storage is uh, hidden from the, from the user, and it's unique in the MLIR context. Even though it's a dialect-specific defined data structure, you can hook it into, into the type uniqueer. Um, and you can have then a nice type uh, C++ class that represents all the semantic of your type. So for our custom arrays, there you can get the shape, the rank. You can check if they are generic or if type inference already inferred the shape. And you can have a bunch of properties that are fully specific to, to your own representation. So as soon as you implement uh, your own type and your, your parsing and your printing for dialect, uh, trying to pipe um, invalid uh, um, uh, MLIR for the toy IR will just uh, fail the verifier. So here, this is an invalid type, and I get a nice error message. If I don't provide the full shape, if I provide an empty list of shape, I get an error. Same if I don't finish the list of, of shape. And if I provide a well-formed example, I just get a nice round trip through MLIR. Uh, so we already have a good verifier for the, um, for the types, and we're just going to do the same thing for Operations. So each of the operations in our language. Yes. Uh, just know uh, when did you specify those class array? Uh, try on, try on, the same type. Uh, on the dialect here, this hook pass type that you override is called by the framework every time there is an opaque type for this dialect, and that's where you can verify or or do whatever you want. Um, operations uh, inherit from. Uh, with a CRTP pattern here from the up, and they can define, define traits. So we have a generate call in, 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 to, in, in our toy AR, and it takes a variadic number of arguments, but it always returns one result. 
and that's from the programming language operations in MLIR could return multiple results unspecified here. Um, so uh, an operation is identified by its name. That's how you register the operation to the framework. Uh, you can implement a verifier. Uh, you implement a factory method that is used by, by, by the builder, the MLIR builder, to hook into it. And then you can implement all the semantic of your operation uh, again in this, in this class and interact with it when the new write transformation passes. <laughs> all right, now that we implement this for all of our built-ins and um, multiplication and addition, um, we have an IR that is fully checked. If I try again an invalid example, I get an error message with the location and everything telling me that the print built-in requires a single operand. And with this, we achieved an IR that is well-formed and, and verified, and, and we can keep invariants in place. So high-level transformation. Um, one of them is generic function specialization. As I mentioned, when you find a call for a function, you have to infer the shape, but you have to specialize it. So this is how, um, uh, how it's implemented in Toy. You have the generic function. You have an attribute on the function telling us it's generic. Shapes haven't, hasn't been inferred. Um, and it's not much different from a C++ template. Um, so the way it would be implemented in, in, uh, in Clang would be on the AST, doing an AST to AST transformation. Um, in, 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 MLIR, in MLIR, you can implement it with, uh, with just transformation passes, which are much easier to understand and to debug because you can go progressively from one form to another, staying in the same uh, uh, IR and with all the invariants preserved. So we just write a pass, and the passes are very similar to LLVM. So there's not much surprise here. You have a pass manager, you have analysis, um, and that's how it works. So if you go more to specific, oh, I'm not showing the code for the shape inference, but it's like 300 lines of code that you can find, uh, again, in the example folder on GitHub. Uh, language specific optimization, that's my motivating example. If you do a no-op, uh, no one does that, but after inlining, you may end up with those kind of patterns when you do a transpose of transpose of an array. That's trivial. You can just like eliminate the double transpose because you get the same results. Um, it's very trivial, but Clang wouldn't be able to optimize it. So I just wrote this quick, very, very simple example. I take an array, I create a local one, and I just do a transpose, the most simple one I can write, and the reverse transpose, and I sync the array, and LLVM at any optimization level will never today eliminate uh, the temporary and the loops. But if you operate at a high level AR, it's very easy to pattern match and to eliminate those kind of thing. You can write a lot of patterns to optimize um, those kind of transforms. So, in, Toy, uh, in MLIR, um, we have this uh, pattern rewriter framework where you inherit from the rewrite pattern and um, you register your pattern with the, to say, I want a root that is the operation name. It's going to be matched on this operation. <laughs> and then your callback is, or this function is, this override is uh, invoked and you can just then do your, your transposition, uh, your match here. Um, and that's what I do here. I'm looking for the operand, trying to match a transpose of a transpose. Uh, if I don't find it, it's a match failure. Otherwise, I can just replace um, the results of the current operation with the, 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 the operand of the other transpose. Um, it's quite a lot of C++ here, but um, we, have pattern, we have table gen implementation, and that's one line of table gen. And you can implement lots of those patterns very easily in table gen. Uh, in just a few lines and iterate on, on more and more patterns and, and table gen is, is, is great for this. Um, and that's it for the high level view of, of uh, Toy and the high level optimization. But to be useful, we need to generate code. And that's what Alex is going to show you now. Hi. So now that we have this Toy language and because we're building compilers, I think it's reasonable to try and make this toy executable. That's what we usually do. So, but the problem is that MLIR does not have a code generator for any target. So you cannot just generate x86 or GPU or whatever assembly you have. Luckily, LLVM does have all of those. And in MLIR, we have an LLVM <coughs> dialect. So the thing that we should do to target and make an executable code is we want to transform the intermediate representation for the toy language that we have into an LLVM IR. 
And th this looks classical in this stuff usually in compilers, and it wouldn't really be multi-level, and we claim that MLR is multi-level among other things. So we will also introduce a linear algebra dialect that has some common features between toy IR, toy IR, TensorFlow, BLAST, PyTorch, whatever else. And then because it's a tutorial, the only common thing would be memory abstraction and the matrix multiplication. But you can imagine that we can easily grow it into a more complex thing, and Nicholas later will show how exactly we'll do that. So the actual transformation picture will be a little bit more involved. So we introduce this new dialect. We know how to convert from toy to itself. We will show you how to convert from toy to a mix of linear algebra and standard scalar operations. We also show how to convert from Z mix to LLVMIR. And here you can say, wait, you now have two dialects coexisting in the same module. Yes, and we split that into two different conversions. One we already have available in MLIR that converts from standard scalar vector stuff into LVM. And the only thing we will have to implement is a conversion from linear algebra to LLVM. And then we can mix it with the existing conversion in the same infrastructure and have it run as a single conversion bus. <coughs> so to make a conversion between the dialects, most of which should be defined, we actually need three components. One is we need to convert function signatures. And why it's important to convert those? Because, for example, MLIR supports multiple returns from a function. So you can return a tuple that is not really a tuple, just many values. And LVM does not. So if you want to convert that, you'd have to change your function signature. It also comes handy when you target GPUs, when you have calling conventions, so on. So here's an example where you would have this multi return, and then we would convert to an LVM struct type. And we'll see how that's done. Obviously, we need type conversion. So when you define a conversion of function signature, at some point you'll say, well, there's an argument of this type. I need it in a different dialect type. The same applies to region arguments, to block arguments, and to some other standing types. So we still have I64 in MLIR, it's same as LVM. We have F32 for floats, just for consistency. So we need to know how to convert those. And finally, and probably most importantly, we need to know how to convert operations. So for example, we need to know how do we convert from a standard add float in MLIR to a float add in LVM, and so on. So let's look at this linear algebra dialect very briefly because we know what we are targeting in conversion. So it covers memory buffer abstractions, common operations such as matrix matrix and matrix vector multiplications. And you can think of it as a simplified dialect for demonstration that will further extend. So it includes two types, a range. It's like a Python range for arrays or for trying subarrays. It's actually three integers that we use as minimum, maximum step. It has a notion of a view into a blob of memory that gives you some nice properties like mm -hmm. multi-dimensions, projections, strides. It has mass operations on those views. So you can do matrix, matrix multiplication, you can do dot products, you can generalize if you wish. And it also has memory operations. Because we have views, we don't access directly the memory. We need to create those views first, and then we need to access the data through those views. And we can define that the way we defined toy dialect. We'll not go into details about that. They're on GitHub. Uh, bottom line, we have two new types. We have a dozen of operations, and we need to convert between all of those. So a view abstraction is something like this, and you will see details later. The interesting part for the conversion is, uh, well, type conversion. And let's start with a simple type, which is a range, and we defined it as a triple of min, max, and step, and it's triple of integers. And that's quite an easy conversion. You can just say that linear algebra range is an LLVM structure containing three integers. I took 64 bits because pretty much everyone uses 64 bits for sizes these days. So, and to define a type conversion, it's actually just a function that converts from a type to another type. Okay, so we can do this the same for LVM as for toy. So for toy, you would convert the toy to memory abstraction. So you just check that your type is a toy array, and you would create a different type, and then you convert it. That's all you need to do. 
So if your type was more complicated, for example, we have an example in view, that function would have been longer when it was a slide, but the part that matters is you only convert one type into another. Operation conversion is defined as a class that inherits from a single dialect of conversion in which you define a single function. It's actually almost the same interface as the high-level graph you're writing for TensorFlow, TensorFlow works. So you have a function that returns the values produced by the operation. You have many of them. It's a vector. This function takes an original operation that you need to convert. You can pattern match it. You can check that it has some properties. You can have multiple conversions for the same operation depending on the parents. You take an IR builder that looks pretty similar to LLVM's IR builder, and you take the transformed operands. So that's the basic structure. And before we go into that, we actually should introduce the LLVM dialect that we should ultimately target. And we do have LLVM dialect. It does not yet have a complete LVM instruction set, but it's really, really easy to extend. So a dialect, even for LVM, is defined as a table gen file. And it looks like that. This, that is the natural definition of an LVM load. So it starts with the ten, uh, table gen class saying we have one result op. It has a name for MLIR operations or an op code for LVM instructions, same thing for us. It has a list of arguments where for load it's only one argument of an LLVM type, whatever LLVM type is. It has a name, address, so we can use it in patterns. And finally, it has a builder call, so the builder will get transformed to an actual LLVM IR builder. And based on that, we can take an LLVM IR dialect in MLIR and just transform it into an actual LLVM. And the entire file for I think, at least half of LLVM instructions is like 200 lines. OK, so that's how the load would look like in MLIR LLVM dialect, and how a gap would look like. All of them are quite simple. OK, so going back to this operation conversion, let's look how we define that range operation. And we have a range type and a range operation that creates a type. So that's the entire code. I'm not expecting you to read. You can read on GitHub later. But what's important is how do you build the conversion? And you redefine this operation, and you have a sequence of instructions that create new operations in the convert module. So here there are two. One is undef, another is insert value. Well, insert value is just LVM's insert value. Undef is a little bit surprising because undef is just a value in LVMIR. And in MLIR, it's a little bit more intricate because instructions are not values. So we need new instructions to create values such as constants and undefs, and we have one. So constructing IR using this syntax is quite simple. You just call a function that has the same name as the instruction, module names, namespaces, and you pass arguments to it. So you call the instruction called undef that would create an undef operation for you. You say what type you want. For many instruction, you actually have to specify the return type because undef can be any type. You pass the operands the operation expects that can be values, that can be results of other operations. You can compose functions and change them nicely. You pass attributes if your function takes them. So here, for example, I'm coding a fake function called make position attribute. But for insert value, you pass extra arguments about the position of, the, of your structure type in which you should insert the value. So here we insert in position 0. And that's just a helper function that creates an attribute. And you have a sequence of these, which you can also express using a familiar syntax using an IR builder. The only difference here is IR, IR builder is more templated than LVM, so you actually pass the operation you create as a template argument. The two are exactly the same. This is a little bit more verbose. Sometimes it's also a little bit more powerful. You can have a full example on GitHub. And then finally, we want to put this all together into the dialect version framework. And I will skip the function signature conversion part. You can guess how it works. If it's an argument, you just call type conversion for it. If it's a result, if it's one result, you just call type conversion. If it's multiple results, you have to do something. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think of how to do something and try to implement that. A hint, we actually have that implementation somewhere in the MLR. OK, so out of these three things, 
type, con type conversion is uh, the type conversion function we defined. We just have it in the class. Function signature conversion is another function which takes function type, returns function type, and operation conversion is a function that returns a list of class instances that we just defined, similar to these things. That's pretty much it for me. Doing this will convert toy to linear algebra or LVM or both. Doing this multiple times with different operation conversions will get, get you an LLVM IR dialect, which you can just pass to either MLIR translate to get an actual LVM or to MLIR CPU runner that would just execute it using JIT. So now linear algebra is a little bit more involved and interesting than I presented, and Nicholas will explain how that works and how that gives us high level optimizations. Hi, everyone. Um, so we have just seen how we can use essentially MLIR to build uh, a new language, how to create a type system, how to create dialects, how to lower all the way to LLVM. And now I would like to present um, essentially a, a view that's maybe a little bit higher level. How can we essentially try to define something uh, uh, that operates at a higher level of abstraction and see how MLIR makes these things uh, easy? Um, so essentially the exercise that I'm engaged here in is to build a linear algebra dialect. And the idea is really to try and showcase MLIR on a non-obvious problem. Um, so the rationale here is that we want to build this linear algebra dialect uh, and compiler <coughs> which has the following properties. So we want it to be uh, high level enough that it's easy to lower into from the toy uh, language or for the uh, toy dialect. Um, but the key property that we want here is that this linear algebra dialect should have uh, linear algebra primitives as first class citizens. Um, it should be easy to lower into library calls, into uh, ISAs that are potentially coarser grain, um, but also all the way to LLVMIR using the, the, the type of techniques that Alex presented. Um, we also want this linear algebra dialect to support some key transformations, such as tiling fusion, some bulk memory transfers. Um, but the key really is that we really want to be able to lock in some performance gains that a good library implementation provides, um, or that a coarser grain ISA provides. We need to be able to emit those operations without losing information. So really what we're trying to do here in terms of as an exercise is really to use MLIR to optimize a mix of loop and library calls for both locality and taking advantage of custom implementations. Um, and we want to do this in hopefully the cheapest possible way in terms of implementation complexity. And essentially we want to reuse as much of what's available as standard uh, operations in MLIR uh, as possible to not reinvent the wheel each and every time. And so essentially we really want to, to use all the SSA support that MLIR has built in on these custom dialects. Um, we want to define new uh, um, operations and see how we can lower to um, a mix of operations in different dialects, um, which is a feature that, that MLIR makes pretty easy. In particular, we're going to use some of this concept of the affine for loop nest, um, the load and stores over this memref abstraction, which is essentially a contiguous memory buffer. And we want really to be as simple and idiomatic as possible. So um, you can consider this as a uh, um, front view section uh, uh, of the cross section slide that uh, Alex presented a little bit earlier. But basically the idea is that we start from the toy AST, we go into the toy IR, um, and from the toy IR, we lower to the linear algebra dialect, and there, different paths uh, start showing up. So we can either lower to a mix of affine uh, um, dialect and linear algebra dialect, where we can do some transformations, such as tiling and, and fusion, bulk memory transfers. Um, and then we have different paths where we can go all the way to LLVM IR and LLVM to actually execute the code. So first, we're going to focus on the linear algebra uh, uh, box and 
essentially define the type system, which Alex already introduced uh, briefly. So we're going to uh, make another pass on this. So we essentially have this um, linear algebra range type, which is essentially a triple of mean, max, and step. Um, and it's essentially used to step over loop iterations. So it essentially gives loop bounds and strides, uh, but also over data uh, structures, I, as I will show um, right next. So this is our first very basic type. It piggybacks on this index type, which is essentially an index uh, int PTR um, that, that comes uh, with MLIR. So on top of this, we can now build a view type. So a view type is essentially a multi-dimensional indexing over a memref type. Uh, it takes ranges, it takes a, a memref buffer, um, and essentially describes how the uh, data is stepped over. Um, the, the view type is essentially inspired by uh, many previous work. Essentially, it's been used pretty much everywhere in the Fortran community, in APL community. Boost multi-array is actually pretty similar to this view type. And essentially, right now, it's kind of the main abstraction to iterate over data in the machine learning community. It's actually very similar to a torch view for those uh, familiar with the, with the concept. But the, the main takeaway is that MLR allows you to build such high-level abstraction easily directly in your, to your type <coughs> system um, and, and operate on them. So one of the uh, um, uh, key things that you can do with views is essentially you can take partial uh, uh, views of your, actually, uh, uh, of your actual backing data. You can take a full view, which is essentially represented here in green, and then you can take partial view. Um, for people familiar with full and partial tile separations, the view kind of captures that um, abstraction in the data type itself. So you don't have to worry too much about it in the loop bounds, but you can actually capture it in the data type. Um, and once we have these views, you can also essentially take slices of these views, which are subviews, and have these interesting properties that they're essentially uh, um, subsets. They're strict subsets. And they have this kind of monotony pro uh, property, which allows you to uh, reason about uh, dependencies of, of uh, read and write regions and essentially allow you to perform transformations without worrying about performing deep analysis. Um, so a slice essentially looks like uh, um, we start from a 2D view and you can take a 1D sub view by taking a slice <laughs> along a particular dimension and in there you can take another slice and that becomes a single uh, data element. So now um, Coming a little bit back uh, uh, to the notion of a view, this is a maybe a, um, a deeper uh, uh, dive into how a particular view type can lower all the way to LLVMIR. It's, a, uh, it, it's um, um, essentially uh, uh, taking this uh, abstraction that we have in MLIR over ranges and views and converting it into this uh, view type descriptor, which is essentially a base pointer, sizes, strides, and the base offset. And so essentially with this uh, um, simple LLVM data structure, you can represent this uh, view type. So now I'm going to introduce the different operations uh, that we have in linear algebra. Um, so we're still at the level of this linear algebra IR box. Now we have defined a type system. We're going to define the operations that operate on this type system. Um, and so, essentially, we have a um, notion of a linear algebra operation, which um, in, this, uh, in this talk, we only show the um, matrix multiplication, matrix vector, and dot product. Uh, but in general, it, it, it's a pretty general uh, operation that can represent many more uh, um, complex operations. So here, we, we show <laughs> how to write a um, matrix multiplication verification, uh, which hooks into the MLIR <clears throat> verification pass. Um, so here, the, the matrix multiplication only verifies that it has three operands and that the operands are of the right type and essentially that the views are of rank two because matrix multiplications operates on 2D matrices. So this is the abstraction that we're using. And so the way we define matrix multiplication is essentially um, as an operation that operates on two-dimensional views. And um, we can write and check uh, um, the IR that essentially starting from two 
uh, three, sorry, memory regions, uh, A, B, and C, essentially create this range abstraction and this view abstraction over these uh, memory buffers and call a matrix multiply on this abstraction. So all this IR is checked and verified and MLIR provides all the infrastructure to define such higher level operations um, pretty easily. We can also define a uh, matrix vector, which is essentially a uh, slice of a matrix multiplication and so the way we can implement this and say, well, a matrix multiplication operates on a two-dimensional view, which is the matrix A, and then one-dimensional views, which is the input and output <laughs> vectors. And um, in order to actually implement it in MLIR, uh, it's pretty simple. You just take slices. So here I conveniently took uh, the slice at element zero for two of the input uh, uh, matrices, which become vectors, and now I can call matrix vector on it. And so, um, again, this is type checked, it passes a verifier, et cetera. Um, you, can do one, you can go one level lower and now say, well, actually your matrix, uh, matrix vector lowers to this axp dot product uh, thing where you can, again, take another slice and get to uh, essentially a zero dimensional view, which is one pointer to one element and call the dot product operation on it. If this goes away. Um, okay, so now we have defined these uh, basic operations. Um, you may remark that we're still at the level at which these things are called view, uh, dot, matrix, multiply, etc. So even though we don't have it in this particular uh, case, it's pretty easy to extrapolate on how these things can lower directly to a blast call, basically. You, you have the information, you have not lost it, so you can uh, uh, lower it to um, actual function calls. Um, now I'm going to discuss lowering, but uh, not lowering directly to blast calls, but lowering essentially within this mix of a fine and linear algebra dialect. So this loop plus library, uh, um, um, I would say abstraction that I was describing. Um, so basically, we're starting from this uh, IR, and we essentially want to write a matrix multiplication as um, um, a loop over um, matrix vectors. And Given that we are at a high level of abstraction uh, and, and this, these operations are actually defined in MLIR, it's actually pretty easy to write a um, rewriting function for an operation which essentially knows how to expand itself to a set of loops and other operations. And so this is actually done completely declaratively. So each operation can uh, declare in a few lines of code how it lowers itself into something else. Uh, and this become essentially pattern uh, um, rewriting <coughs> rules that you can introduce in your, uh, in your system and essentially hook it up to uh, uh, the system that Mehdi showed earlier with table gen and all these rewrites become part of your um, um, system. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, maybe your ISA actually has a matrix vector um, unit and not a matrix multiplication unit. So in that case, that's one uh, uh, obvious case where you would want to do these kind of things. Um, so in practice, um, as I mentioned, the operations just define how to lower themselves as a mix of essentially affine loops and linear algebra operations. And really it can be thought of as a kind of a decreasing potential function for lowering. So essentially you start from a high level form, you want to go to a lower level form, but you don't have to go all the way to LLVMIR directly or to uh, a different dialect. You can lower within the same dialect or mix of operations from different dialects together, um, but you actually just need to define a kind of monotonic decreasing uh, potential function for lowering, which kind of opens up a bunch of interesting trade-offs uh, uh, in lowering. How do you want to go from point A to point B? And there's multiple options always. So here I'm just showing in this, this um, um, MLR-based API, which has essentially your traditional uh, uh, walker that, that goes post-order on ERR, and then you can essentially, you know, if your operation is a matrix multiply, you can write yourself as a finer grain operation. Um, technically, in practice, they would be written as patterns, but you can also write it as simple C++ code and experiment with things. <clears throat> so now we want to go all the way to loops from matrix multiplication, um, but we don't have a finer grain uh, uh, abstraction than uh, uh, dot product, basically. So to go all the way to, to pure loops, we actually need to go to scalars, and we introduce two additional operations called lean, add, load, and store, 
whose only purpose is to say, these are load and store instructions that operate on view, right? Because MLIR doesn't know about views. Views is an extension we're making here. We need a load and store that understands views and goes all the way to LLVM. And this is the, the, the portion that Alex presented, the portion that goes to LLVM. But assuming we have introduced those load and stores, um, similarly, um, that a operation declares how it expands itself to other operations and loops, it can also declare how it expands itself to all the way uh, um, loops and um, essentially linear algebra load and store operations that convert to LLVMIR and then can be executable, et cetera. Um, so in this particular case, um, there is a, a interchange that's happening. So this is maybe a little bit more in the, in the detail, but the idea is that um, by going to finer grain linear algebra abstractions from matrix multiplication to matrix vectors, you have some API impedance mismatch that can start kicking in because maybe BLAS2 and BLAS3 calls are not naturally composable. And so um, what, what, what you get is essentially by partial lowering, some of these loops may be reordered. Um, as long as the, the rewriting is legal, and it is legal by construction, um, this, uh, this become essentially implementation details, and depending on how you lower, you could get different uh, uh, orderings of these loops. Um, so now I'm going to go one uh, level uh, lower, and now start showing a little bit how we can perform um, transformations on this abstraction. And so the transformations we're looking at is essentially tiling, and then I'll quickly skip over the uh, um, the other two uh, transformations demonstrate what they produce, and then we can discuss and, and um, see the code on, on GitHub. Um, so an operation also declares how to tile itself maximally on loops. So what this means is essentially that um, an, an operation gives a hook to the transformation system on how tiling can be applied onto it. Um, this uh, uh, results essentially in the ability to do multi-level uh, uh, tiling. It, it enables the transformation in a declarative fashion. Like you don't have to do any kind of complex loop analysis in order to uh, um, determine the legality and the applicability of tiling. You just declare it. And so um, in practice, there is an internal uh, um, operation um, on tiling which is essentially composable. It looks a little bit like halide if, if, uh, for people who are familiar, but basically you can just apply the tiling transformation at the proper places and the tiling uh, uh, will, um, will happen on the IR. And so what it looks like if we actually apply the tiling on the uh, um, uh, loop form of the matrix multiplication is we can declare that we want to tile by eight by nine and the IR is automatically uh, um, generated and the, the um, um, matrix multiplication operation is rewritten into uh, tiled form. Um, so this is loop tiling. There's another version of tiling which operates on view. And um, the interesting aspect is when you tile on views, you start seeing some of these uh, block linear algebra uh, properties start to uh, appear. So how this is achieved is, again, in a very declarative form, a linear algebra operation declares um, how to tile itself over views. So this happened essentially in three steps that um, I'm not going to go into details here, but uh, we can, we can um, see those in, uh, on GitHub. Um, so the first step is essentially to declare a mapping from loops to view. So an operation should uh, uh, declare how the loops that it lowers into map to the data elements. Um, then the second step is to create the tiled loops, and the third step is to apply the tiling on the views. And so um, once you write those three steps, um, it is essentially, um, it becomes very declarative and composable to apply tiling. Um, the result of applying tiling at this level is essentially that you can take your original matrix multiplication and now say that you want to generate this eight by nine tile. Um, so you do it, you tile your views, which essentially now are subviews by uh, applying uh, slice operations and then folding them away. So this is the result of folding the slices away. So you can see that now you have subviews at A and B and C, 
And now we have a loop of tiles over matrix multiply. So what we actually managed to do here is to uh, tile a library in terms of loops over the same library. So there's this recursive nature uh, popping out. But more importantly, we can actually still do tiling and call the BLAS call that's fast for the single core um, um, without losing any information. And all of this is done without any type of complex analysis, inverting control flow from scalar load stores into back into uh, 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 primitives. Uh, this is all essentially thanks to partial lowerings and essentially MLIR gives you all the, the, the properties to uh, uh, all the infrastructure to do this um, um, in a relatively simple way. Um, so other transformations that we are also able to, to implement as an exercise for, for this tutorial, essentially um, the ability to tile an operation and essentially go fuse its producer inside the tile. So this is a, uh, um, essentially a um, both locality enhancing uh, property and uh, um, uh, still has the ability to call into these library calls. And then another transformation implemented is the ability to promote and copy views into a faster memory buffer. Um, I'm going to show the results of this transformation. I'm not going to show how they are done. But in each case, the, C, the, the, um, the PR for, uh, for this case is about three to 400 lines to essentially create a transformation that is quite generic, works on different type of operations, and gives you some pretty advanced uh, properties. So um, here's what tiling and fusing the producers actually look like. So we start from a two, an example which has two matrix multiplications. And we apply three-dimensional uh, tiling on the second matrix multiplication. And the fusion um, um, pulls in its producer, which is uh, the, the first MATML, and allows you essentially to have this uh, um, combined, tiled, fused, and a uh, mix of library calls that still occurs after transformation. Um, again, MLR makes this possible because we do this in a, uh, a lowering, partial lowering way and not in a go to loops and then uh, try to get raise the abstraction again. Um, and then I'll show also what promoting buffers look like. So to promote buffers, we introduce <coughs> two new operations that perform copy, reshape, and transposes. And so essentially, it's pretty similar. You tile the matrix multiplications using the view abstraction. And then um, each of the uh, producer produced and consumed views are essentially transferred with this new operation whose implementation details remain to be discussed. But basically, it gets transferred into a faster memory region. So MLR supports this notion of memory address spaces. So it goes from the default memory address space to the number one memory address space. Um, the operation happens in this address space and then goes back into the uh, main memory. Um, so to conclude, basically, um, one of the, I would say, the things that, that, that we learned using MLIR, designing and using MLIR, is that essentially it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great compiler infrastructure to essentially reduce the impedance mismatch between uh, IRs. So, IR design in general, it involves multiple trade-offs. It's a very uh, iterative and, and uh, error-prone process. Uh, but basically, MLIR allows you to uh, mix level of abstractions. Uh, and it, this has non-obvious compounding benefits. So one of the benefits is that when you have multiple dialects, going from one dialect to the next is actually quite easy. There's not a huge gap from. Uh, the toy to the linalg or the linalg to the linalg plus loops and then to LLVM, if you had to go directly from toy to LLVM, there's a pretty big impedance mismatch. And MLR essentially allows you to reduce this. You, you can lower from A to D, you may skip B and C in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the mix, but basically it's all about reducing the IR impedance mismatch and making lowerings and transformations much easier to express. Um, and one of the ways this achieves it is by avoiding lowering too early. So you keep information as long as possible. You stay in the higher level form as much as possible. Then you lower progressively. And this allows you to also define some hard analysis away. Um, memory dependency analysis and what type of transformations you're allowed to do and legality and profitability of 
uh, of transformations can be essentially thought of in kind of with a fresh look, uh, uh, look taking a fresh look at the, at the problem. <clears throat> so to recap, um, we think MLR is a really uh, great infrastructure for higher level compilation. It, it offers gradual and partial lowerings um, to essentially mixed dialects all the way to LLVMIR. You define how quickly you want to lower out of a dialect into another one, but it's very progressive. Um, and essentially, this has the, the pretty interesting effect of reducing the, the complexity at each level um, and reducing the impedance mismatch between, between IRs. So MLIR provides all the infrastructure to build these dialects and these transformations. And what's really comfortable here is that at each level of your lowerings, it's always the same uh, LLVM style infrastructure that, that, that people are accustomed to. And um, it's essentially translate from level to level, which makes it quite easy once um, the, the, the basic principles are, are, are understood to essentially apply it over and over again and, and um, start solving higher level and more complex uh, uh, problems. So we demonstrated all this on the toy language uh, with a line, linear algebra dialect, which lowers all the way to uh, LLVM and executes. Um, and so the, the full tutorial and code is available on GitHub. Um, so MLIR is now open source, as has been uh, uh, announced already um, in, the, in, the, in the keynote. So you can um, go see the code. We are not yet accepting contributions because we don't yet have a single source of truth. But as soon as we have the uh, CI set up on GitHub, we'll essentially be happy to um, collaborate with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Midi, Alex, and Nicola. Are there any questions you would like to ask? Questions? Hi, thanks. Okay, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a question about how you uh, lower operations that have regions attached to them. So if you're lowering down to LLVMIR, which can't, well, doesn't, you can't have regions attached to it, are you, uh, look, sorry, looking at the API you showed for lowering, it looked like it took a function builder in, in it, which m sort of suggests that when you're lowering the operation, you're forced to inline the region attached to the instruction into the function. Is that what you have to do? Um, yeah, so Alex, you showed this. So. <coughs> well, it's not on this slide, but basically you have this operation over there, op, you can query the region, and then using the builder, you can also build basic blocks. So when you have a region, for example, a loop region, you would just build multiple basic blocks that constitute that region. But what if you didn't want to emit it into that function? What if you decided, oh, I actually, I want to, I want to build another function on the side that is going to contain the, this region and then call it from the, the, the new function that you're building? That seems possible. So on, on a builder, you can also yeah. call to create a new function and then call that function from that. Oh, you can. Okay. So yeah, I we, we didn't try that. No. Uh, we also can have, uh, I think we eventually have a generic region outlining to functions that would, that may be orthogonal, but basically with a builder, you can build almost any part of the IR you want, except for modules. Okay. So you can create a new module. Okay. Uh, outlining a region to a function, for instance, would not be part of lowering. I would design it like again as another pass. It would be a transformation pass that would be like you're outlining your outlining region uh, for your accelerator of loading, for instance, and you would do it inside your dialect, creating this new function, uh, not as part of lowering to a VM, for instance. You would not do it all at the same time. Oh, okay. And, and so the affine loop, for instance, are reg have region attached. And you can really imagine well how you just create a loop in LLVM by chaining basic blocks. And, and the, the, the region is the body of, of, of the loop, basically, so the content of the basic block. So uh, dialect to dialect conversion is meant to be lowering, but there is nothing that prevents it to be raising the abstraction from a low level dialect to higher level, for example, if you recognize a pattern or? Yeah, you, you can write a pass that transforms any dialect to any dialect. Uh, the specific dialect conversion 
framework is limited in the sense that it operates op by op. Uh, and if you want to raise the level of abstraction, you may want to recognize a loop, for instance. You have to go over many basic blocks. If you want to implement poly, for instance, you can do poly, but you would do it as a set of passes. For instance, you would recognize a scope. Uh, the scope in poly would be a, 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 maybe a region in, in, in MLIR. Now you have your scope in the IR and not as <coughs> metadata on the side, and you can uh, write multiple pass passes that would operate on the scope and reconstruct your high-level semantic. That's how I would approach it, I think. And the second unrelated question, is a pass manager uh, inspired by legacy pass manager or the new pass manager? Uh, well, Chris, be Chris, Chris Yeah, be better than either, learning from both. Yeah, it's like also, also multi-thread. We, we, try, we try to not make the mistake of the legacy pass manager, and at the same time keep some of the aspects of it that we liked. Um, but it's, it's, it's closer to the new one in the spirit. Like there's not a predefined scheduling, analysis are computed on the fly. Like all those, those new goodies from the new bus managers are, uh, were, were totally taken into account. Um, can you tell us a bit more about uh, tooling that comes with MLIR? Like things that you say, the shared infrastructure that uh, you can use across all the dialects? So what would, like visual, I suppose you've got so, some visualization so things. So for instance, uh, it's about um, a table gen, for instance. Uh, it's all the verifier infrastructure. Uh, we have a canonicalizer pass, which is um, your, uh, canonicalization is really important in LVM. Most of the time we use it combine or, or, and we run it all the time. Uh, in MLIR, uh, um, operation can hook into, into the canonicalizer and, and can analyze themselves and their operands. And uh, that's, uh, again, like pieces of infrastructure converging to fixed points. And all the infrastructure for rewriting is like already there. Um, and all the structure to iterate on the IR if you want to walk over all the instruction in a function. right? You don't have to write your visitor, for instance. And that's why uh, we're trying to make MLIR generic enough that you could represent your AST, like the Clang AST, for instance. Uh, in the ideal world, be able to be represented as dialect, and that way you would not have different kind of visitor, different kind of infrastructure, different kind of serialization. We don't have a binary serialization yet. We're gonna get there at some point, like the bitcode, the LLVM bitcode. But you have textual serialization. You can round trip. You don't have to implement this as if you were starting from scratch. So all those like things that we take for, for granted that we use all the time, and we almost forget how heavy it is to rewrite from scratch is is like there. I had a question based on the source location, that source keeping keeping in touch to the source information is very important. Um, does that also reflect the rewrites you've gone through, the number of dialects you've gone through? Is there dialect-specific information to help you track back? Not yet, but we are working on that. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the location info can be extended. And so one thing we have is a fusion location. So when you merge together things that come from multiple different nodes, we can track their origin and things like that. So um, it would make sense to add more domain-specific kinds of representations, including pointers back to the AST nodes, which is what SIL has. Um, okay, so maybe it's a terrible idea, but I was wondering if there could be something of uh, dialect uh, extension or inheritance. Like uh, I have this, I have this dialect, and I want it's not working. Oh, yes, <laughs> and I want to extend it and add new behavior. Is it possible yet, or uh, is it formalized? So, um, and is it? Uh, um, Good things? No, I mean it's something that's that uh, it's not it's not it's not a, a stupid idea. I mean it's something that is that you always want, right? You want to reuse something that someone else did and just extend it for your needs and build on top of it. Um, so far, what I found is that a dialect can compose themselves very well. Like uh, we showed that you can have multiple operations from different dialects in the same function, 
um, and that makes it uh, in general hopefully good enough in the sense that you can extend the dialect by creating your dialect as long as it operates on types that are compatible with the dialect you're trying to extend, by adding new operation, for instance, everything should just work fine. Um, obviously, the restriction that you're going to have is that passes that have been written specifically for the original dialect won't know about your operations. Um, but since MLI is extensible, passes are always uh, used to uh, encounter unknown operation and have to be conservative about it. Um, what MLI can help is your new dialect can, co can coexist in the same function with, uh, with uh, the, the one you're trying to extend. Uh, and the dialect conversion allows you to lower both of them to, to a new dialect. So everything composed well without inheritance in this sense. OK, before we are going heading for lunch, where we're uh, craving for, let's uh, give an applause to the speakers again.